and uh, my good friend George Fitzmaurice. I was just saying it there earlier. I can't believe that it's over twenty years ago since we were standing there trying to to design the Fitzmaurice room. But um, thank you very much. Delighted to be here, even though it is remotely. And um, just before I start, I just want to say that I'd like to dedicate this lecture to, with much love, to my dad, who passed away in September twenty nineteen. Radical Rebel is how I describe George Fitzmaurice and his dissenting drama, which should have been have, should have long since set the theatre world on fire. Long associated with being a pathologically shy, lonely, reclusive man, it is a terribly misleading image, which is rather naively fashioned, was fashioned by Fitzmaurice's earlier biographers, who relied on the recollections of writers like the poet Austin Clark who only came to know Fitzmaurice in his later years. This has hindered a more innovative analysis of his drama. These images conjure up the elderly George shuffling along the Dublin streets, his face almost hidden by his fedora hat. But what about when he lifted his head to show off his apple-shaped shaped face in semi-shadow and the hint of mischievousness hidden somewhere behind his eyes, the hint of wit, intelligence and sheer imagination of, of a man who fervently played pranks in the occasional roles and loved to see pranksters in action. That is the man whom locals knew and testified to, such as those whom I interviewed for the, such as those who were interviewed for the RTE documentary, The Wicked Old Children of George Fitzmaurice, which was first broadcast in June, 1972. Similarly, I heard about George and I interviewed people who knew the family in the early 2000s when researching my biography, which helped me to correct the inaccurate portrayals of George. I spoke with people like Sister Labora Sheehy, Bridie O'Connor, Paddy Flynn and Margaret McElligot, among many others, and I have such great memories of chatting with them, and they were proud to have known the Fitzmaurice's. Tonight, I hope to give you a flavour of why George, the author of some 17 plays, as listed on the slide, is a radical rebel playwright. I will include specific examples of his plays, those plays written before 1915 in particular, and also share some audio clips of excerpts from those plays, which are recorded for RTE Radio. I take a look at my own work on my 2005 biography in George, to dem and also demonstrate why he is a more modern playwright who looked to new inventions at the turn of the 20th century, such as moving pictures, audio phones, live projections and film, which other European playwrights were using at the time. George's dramatic machinations and concoctions encompass the folklore of his own North Kerry, the complicated characteristics and foibles of the locals he met anew, and of course, the sheer music of the North Kerry dialect that became the very foundation of his own dramatic creations. All that combined with the spectacle of raucous commercial Dublin theatrical entertainment of the early 1900s in the music halls, such as the Tivoli and the Savoy, which helped George formulate his own drama after he moved to Dublin in 1901. And of course, he eventually attended the Abbey Theatre on a weekly basis after it opened in 1904, sometimes to see productions of the same play numerous times. He was writing during a time known as the Literary Revival, when so much was happening in literature, both in the English and the Irish languages, as people sought to find the right way of representing Ireland and Irishness on the stage. Fitzmaurice was not a quiet man. On the contrary, he was far from being afraid of making comments, derogatory or otherwise, on the Abbey Theatre directors, including one W.B. Yeats, and was confident at making his voice heard. For example, during the Home Rule crisis, up until the outbreak of the First World War in 1914, Fitzmaurice bravely made comments in public that all nationalists should be in hell, that everyone should be in support of the English and the Great War. Born in 1877 at Bedford House outside Listowel, his family leased the house from Colthurst Bateman. When his Church of Ireland ordained father died when George was 14, Winifred, his mother, Catholic, moved with her children back to her native Dwa, settling in Kilcarra Beg. By the time Fitzmaurice was 23, 
he was publishing short fiction in various Irish broadsheets, a decision prompted by his reading fiction in the newspapers that were delivered daily to the Fitzmaurice's house. His overall fictional narrative is rather condescending in tone, with a satirical edge, and demonstrated some of the stranger themes which he developed later in his drama. When it came to searching out new paper trails to look for Fitzmaurice, the outspoken European influenced dramatist, I turned to the, to the thousands of pages from the diaries of theatre goer extraordinaire Joseph Holloway, which are held in the National Library in Dublin. And Joseph Holloway spent a lifetime going to theatre, almost 50 years, in fact, every single night out of theatre. He met George on a number of occasions and recorded many of George's opinions. When George moved to Dublin, for example, to work as a civil servant, he told Holloway, sure, everyone was writing plays. At the turn of the 20th century, the desire for an Irish dramatic movement had begun to gather momentum, and Yeats, Gregory and company envisaged the founding of a Celtic theatre, which would find inspiration in Irish legend, song and story and then compete with what many believe to be vulgar commercial theatre. There are many opinions about how to develop an authentic Irish national theatre, not without controversy. This led eventually to the foundation of the Abbey Theatre in 1904. With the theatre's limited stage space, the stage measured 21 feet by 15. It influenced the type of setting that Irish dramatists would choose to use in their plays and the controlled physical movements of actors became a staple of the national th theatre repertoire. Fitzmaurice's first love was music hall entertainment. When he's where he saw new inventions like the audio phone, moving pictures, photography, light projections, which had all been introduced to draw the crowds. It was such inventions that influenced European theatre as writers sought to challenge the more conventional modes of making and enjoying theatre. These were anti-realist, absurdist, grotesquely painted scenery and exaggerated acting and movement. Symbolism flourished and major writers like Henry Gibson and August Strindberg moved with the times by creating mythical, unreal journeys on stage. It was a riot against realism, for example, George was writing against the rural realism of the Abbey. But firstly, when George began to write plays, he submitted a realistic comedy, The Country Dressmaker, to this, the Abbey in 1906, a play which demonstrated themes and settings that were, for the most part, acceptable to its directors. The Abbey was absolutely with George Fitzmaurice's submission because after the uh, rights that in, happened with uh, the Playboy of the Western World in January 1907, audiences were dispelled. Nobody was coming to the Abbey Theatre until Fitzmaurice's The Country Dressmaker landed at their feet. And boy, did the crowds come into the theatre then. It tells the tale of dressmaker Julia Shea, who was in love with Pat Connor, who emigrated to the States a decade before. She spends time idolizing about Pat's return, much to her mother's despair. The matchmaker, the man from the mountains, Luke Quilter is called in. When Pat's returns from the States on a holiday, there's a big shock in store, especially when the classy sisters, neighbors of Julius, in true ugly sister style, want Pat, Pat the Yank for themselves. Julia is completely and utterly turned off by what she sees. Pats has gotten old and lost his beautiful head of curls. However, sadly, when all is said and done, the couple decide to marry and all romantic notions long gone as they decide to make the best of it. The play was proved so popular that it reg was regularly revived uh, between 1912 and 1925. And the two images there on the screen, the first one is of Nell Byrne as Julia Shea. She's, she wasn't the original Julia Shea. She played uh, Julia a couple of years after um, 1907. And that poster is a poster of the first production of, um, of The Country Dressmaker. The play itself again was revived during the 1940s in the hope 
that it would become a financial coup once more for the Abbey Theatre. And after forgotten political drama, the Moonlighters, the Moonlighters being a secret organisation that were working to free Ireland by preventing people from paying rent and trying to end landlordism in the 1800s. The play was first staged by the Earlsford Players in Dublin in 1948. And that's a programme there on the left hand side of the slide. And on the right hand side of the slide, you can see the front cover of the Little Old Drama Booth production of the Moonlighters in 1968. The play is set in North Kerry during the land war in the 1880s, when agrarian tensions were high nationwide. A four act play, its plot revolves around four families, the Giran, whose youngest son Eugene goes against his father's wishes by joining the Moonlighters. The Cantillons, Big William Cantillon is the land grabber in the play, and the Driscolls and the Carmodies. The major focus is on the abstract cause of patriotism. It encompasses themes of matchmaking, conflict, cowardice, love, revenge, honour, loyalty and death. The play ends with the death of Peter and a second character, Tom, a moonlighter, who has been on the run, run for months. Both of them are shot dead when con confronted by the police. And it's a very, very underrated play of Fitzmaurice. It's very, very long. Um, and it has had to be cut when it has been staged, but, but a wonderful, wonderful read. Joseph Holloway's diaries confirm that George avidly pursued its production between 1911 and 1914. Actually, he became very, very obsessed with the play. And um, I think he drive, he probably drove the likes of W. Yeats quite mad. He just kept knocking on the door to no avail. The Abbey did consider producing it, judging from a play script which survives in the Abbey archives. The larger than life character is Big William Cantillon, a land grabber. And I'm just going to play a little excerpt of him talking about uh, looking for money to be able to buy some land. And it's from the RT1 documentary um, that was aired in 1972. Listen to me. I must have that hundred pound. God above, if who knew the horrible fright came on me coming from town. At the first glimpse I got of the big bush on the height that showed the Lucy's farm sloping away to the east. Mud Pringle has taken his bridle in my throat. I bathed the horse to a foam and sweat. And galloping like the devil for three miles, I never threw bridle till I reached the boreen. Out of the car I leapt and across the bone stitch. The eyes fried out of my head looking to see if Pringle was walking the farm. Down with me to the river half mad. And Lord. I saw the rich brown bank above the water and the soft green grass waving over the verge. I was fit to eat my fill of that lovely earth and that lovely grass, Maliki Cantley. You'd be as well employed talking to that stone wall as to me. Be off, I'm telling you. I don't bother at all, you gone bean hag. Look at the way I was screeching all night in my sleep. And I haven't every nightmare Pringle had the land. My son John is as bad. At break of day he left out in the middle of the floor. Take that land, father, said he, and don't be courted by no man. But I want a hundred pound. You'll not get a hundred fardings. I'll open the field and roar. I'll start mother with the high clipper of nationality, Eugene. You outrageous villain. Lend it to him, Maliki. Lend him the hundred pound. I'll not let him the price of box of matches. You'll be well secured. Here's the note. My name's it. John's name's it. And I guarantee the transaction will be a secret. And the grabbing won't be public until after the marrying of Eugene. Will that do? Will not do. Is it forcing me out to go over the hills, craving the Gambian Roach, and giving him the interest? Might you as well have the big interest? How much interest? Big interest, great interest, as big as you asked it, Mantley Cantlin. The devil carry you. Here's the money. And now away with you in the shelter of the ditches, and I go down to them that's walking the land. Like the wind I came, and like the wind I go. Depend on me not to be seen, though there's a thing swollen in my chest this moment make me feel the size of an elephant. For Christ's above, I'll have the Lucy's land. That's just wonderful, wonderful stuff. So while realistic comedy might have promised to make Fitzmaurice a household name as an Abbey playwright back then, had he continued to write in this vein, in reality, he had a more ambitious long-term plan, even though it was not going to be good for his literary career. For Fitzmaurice was always radical, a rebel, an outsider, and in essence, he didn't wish to see plays like The Country Dressmaker become an Abbey staple. 
Bar Fitzmaurice, the Abbey epitomised everything he wished theatre and drama to riot against. He was not a conformist. He told Joseph Holloway that, and I quote, he cared not a fig whether the thing seemed real or not, so long as he was interested in the style it was set down on, on stage. Once Fitzmaurice's foot was in the Abbey door, he determined to write within its very walls. He turned realism in Irish drama on its head, and a fellow Dublin writer described him at the time as having a mind only for freak dramas, and that Fitzmaurice was too fantastical for anything. The only way to make his challenge, Fitzmaurice believed, and to challenge the Abbey was by submitting his own fantastical drama there, even with terrible repercussions. His next play, The Piedish, is a strange but fabulous piece of writing and premiered at the Abbey in 1908. So on the left hand side of the screen, we have Arthur Sinclair, who played Liam Donoghue in 1908. And the play was revived for three or four years because it made Sinclair so popular. And on the right hand side, we have our dear friend Eamon Kelly, who played Liam Donoghue in The Piedish in 1976. The play dramatizes the story of Liam Donoghue, who is 80 years of age and whose lifelong obsession has been the completion of his play, Piedish. The play mystified audiences in 1908 and they were unable to understand that this was not a realistic play, it wasn't a comedy and it wasn't a tragedy, but a blend of all three. It was lambasted by critics as being sacrilegious and one writer described it as leather. What horrified most people was the fact that Lame Donoghue declared that if God would not give him time to finish his piedish before he died, then he would pray to the devil to give him more time to do so, which he does before collapsing and dying with the piedish in smithereens. And this is just another um, short audio clip from the 1972 documentary. Oh, Father, try do something for him and you haven't the power. Save Joseph and all the saints in heaven, pray for him. My poor man, give yourself up now to the good God and to his holy mother. and Put all thoughts of this sinful world away from your heart entirely. It's my pie dish I'm thinking of, I'm telling you. My poor old man, what concern is it to you now, a miserable pie dish? Liam Donahue, let me administer to you the last rites of a holy mother of the church. Tisn't to be anointed, I will. Go from me. Oh, my pie dish. My pie dish. Liam Donahue, your hour has come. His hour has come. Oh, the saints in heaven pray for him before it's too late entirely. Was it the priest said my hour has come? It's black lies he's telling me. Tisn't my hour that has come to me. Good God above in heaven, tisn't without mercy you would be. And to take me out of the water like this. Oh, the pain that's through me. Good God, give me time. It's surely you'll give me time. I pray for time to finish my piety. Oh, isn't this a terrible pain entirely? God above, isn't the time I will get after all? God oh, is killing me, that pain is. Good God in heaven, it's time I must get. If it isn't time from God I get, maybe the devil will give me time. Let the devil himself give me time then. Let him give me time to finish my piety. And it says I'll be forever more body and soul. No! There. there, it's in bits now. What it was or what it wasn't, no one in the wide world will be a pin's point the wiser forevermore. It's a scruple, Aunt Joan, if it's gone entirely without the rights he is, and the priest up to his hip itself. He is dead, and it's likely he is damned. Dead and damned, Jack. And it's disgrace to be over him during the duration of time through the length and breadth of Europe. What folly and vanity there do be in this short world. What was in this at all? What was in this at all? Fitzmaurice was disappointed with the Abbey's production of the play. He told Holloway that the Abbey failed to bring out its symbolism. For most audience members, they wanted a comedy only, and they didn't understand what symbolism was, and nor did they care. The likes of John Millington Singh knew what Fitzmaurice was trying to do and was one of the only people in open night to applaud it 
and he actually gave it a standing ovation. When Fitzmaurice's next play, The Magic Glasses, was produced at the Abbey in 1913, the company was suffering increasing uh, public criticism regarding the quality of acting and choice of plays. At this time, theatre critic Ernest Boyd had written a lengthy article in the Irish Times, criticising the Abbey, demanding that the Abbey should make experiments in the interest of dramatic art. Around the same time, Fitzmaurice told Holloway that the high ideals with which the Abbey Theatre was started was shattered long ago. Boyd loved Fitzmaurice's work and he commended the Kerryman's extraordinary power of fantasy and grotesque vision. He was perhaps best position, positioned to interpret the magic glasses as Fitzmaurice's most daring play to date, for it was a deliberate parody of the Abbey. The Magic Glasses was Fitzmaurice's chance to belittle the National Theatre on its very own stage, a bringing down of the house, it seemed. The one act play, sorry, the one act play, The Magic Glasses, is a play of madness and mania, which tells the story of one Jamie Lee Shanahan and his incredible claims regarding the wonderful visions he sees in a set of coloured glasses that he purchased from a fair. The 38 year old has spent most of his adult life in the loft at his parents' house, gazing at these visions in the blue, brown, and red glasses. His parents are in a tizzy and have called for the charlatan quack doctor Morgan Quill to cure Jamie's obsessions. The build-up is tense, and Jamie's father, Padden, is suspicious and afraid. Eventually, Quill succeeds in getting Jamie down from the loft, but becomes more enthralled than anyone at hearing about the visions Jamie says he sees in the glasses. When Quill asks Jamie why he stays in the loft, Jamie answers, better than being in the slush, same old thing every day. It's an ugly spot and the people ignorant, grumpy and savage. All in all, the play concludes in a dark and gory fashion when Jamie's father and two arm aunts, dazzled drunk, get stuck to the ladder which leads to the loft and the loft collapses. Jamie's death is a gruesome, bloody one and he is found under the rubble, his throat cut by the magic glasses themselves. How in 1913, you might wonder, if the Abbey stage was so small, did it deal with a collapsing set? The answer is quite simple, they didn't. Instead, the ending was changed. Lennox Robinson, its director, decided that there would be no collapsing loft, no bloodied corpse, and no keening to close the play. Instead, one Jamie Shanahan remained alive taking the glasses from the loft and left the stage playing them as if they were musical instruments. And so Robinson's decision to alter the play's conclusion radically put a completely different complexion on the story. Fitzmaurice was furious and described the change as having defeated the purpose of his play by making it unmenacing. With the collapse of the loft, Fitzmaurice had intended this as bringing down the house, literally bringing down the Abbey, the Abbey house itself. The slide on the left is a partial image of uh, par part of the panel from the Geneva window by the artist Harry Clark, and it's part of an eight paneled window in which Clark planned to illustrate the work of 15 early 20th century Irish writers including Fitzmaurice, and there is Jamie in all his glory with um, his goblets and uh, his magic glasses. It was, Clark was commissioned to create this as a gift for the League of Nations. And in one section, as you can see, Clark has his um, interpretation of Jamie, but the government rejected the commission, claiming it as being unsuitable and its depiction of naked women was deemed offensive, so we can probably blame poor George for that as well. Fitzmaurice berated the Abbey Theatre's management lack of respect for dramatists and their work, and he said that the directors chop and change despite the author's wishes, and more often than not, 
ruin the pieces they so change. Although the decision not to collapse the cottage and the abbey production and to have Jamie alive at the play's end might have quelled any design headaches, the damage was done to the play's standing in the Irish dramatic repertoire and wasn't staged correctly until 1946 by Austin Clark's Lyric, Lyric Theatre Company, which was a very, very physicalised production and choreographed by the well-known choreographer Irina Brady at the time. Fitzmaurice's play, which coincides with the rise of cinema as an art, would have been possible to imagine this play as a short film. Fitzmaurice would have seen his first moving pictures in the Tivoli Theatre. Jaminy tells Quill that it's the pleasure and diversion you will hear and see in the glasses, and the play's main theme is reality versus, versus illusion to reality. What is real? And what is it that Jaminy really sees in his magic glasses? I like to imagine it as being as if Jaminy was above in the loft, watching moving pictures in his own virtual projection, projectionist's room. The photograph there, it's, uh, it's from um, the Irish Independent in 67, and it's the Abbey production of the magic glasses. I'm going to be talking about that in a minute, just after I play a little excerpt from the play. Uh, yes, I, I have it. Put the tongs in the fire and redden it. Holy Father, me. Put the tongs in the fire and redden it. Hey, down there. Is it head drawn yet? Tis drawn and, sh and shall it drawn, Germany. Tis, tis not drawn and tis not wet itself. For it's after washing up the chain you are in the boiling water and putting cold water in the kettle. Don't be trying to blink me. For I heard the cover rattling and tis the same with you every day. Using the water and leaving me waiting for my tea. The selfishness of this world is a terror. But I'm warning you now, if the tea isn't drawn the minute I hop down out of this, there isn't a mug in the dresser I won't smash, and I'll break the window. And so every devil around the house will make it a sorry day to you. You got into the habit of reneging me in the tea. As peevish as a cat always when coming out of that top laugh, Mr. Green. Here now, you vagabond. Isn't it on the table? It is itself. And listen to me putting the sugar into it and stirring the sugar in the cup. And the white bread and jam. And the white bread and the jam. There now. Isn't it quick enough for you, my walking gentleman upstairs? It will do. And just to be hoped you'll be a regular for the future. It would be a great boon to me entirely. That jam is damn nice, mother dear. Down on your knees, you, you <laughs> haunted thing, you. Keep looking at me, or I'll send this red hot tongues fizzling down into your beastly guts. Sacramento Dominus for Biscum Mia Culpa, Mia Maximum Culpa, Kyrielison Excelsior. I abjure thee by these words. Tell me what you are and what you aren't. Are you a Catholic? A Yenter. A faith. Very good. And now, my boko, if you are, maybe you'll say what I have to say after me. In the name of the Father. In, in the name of the Father. In the name of the Son. In the name of the Son. In the name of the Holy Ghost. Uh -huh. in, in the name of the Holy Ghost. Uh, come along, here. You're some sort of a Christian anyway. You see? I just want to go back a uh, slide there. Um, just on the right-hand side of the, uh, the slide there, the screen there, it's the first page of the handwritten version of the Magic Glasses. Um, very, very rare to find anything that Fitzmaurice is actually handwritten. And uh, the full manuscript is there, hidden away in the Dalman Press Archive at Wake Forest University. And um, the first time I was able to touch it, I, we didn't know it was there. I was in absolute awe just to even, just to look at Fitzmaurice's neat, neat handwriting. So as I was saying, the play was staged in 1967 at the Abbey, and it included Maura O'Sullivan, who's there, the second uh, figure from the left with the shawl on her head. And it also included Eamon Keane, who's there kneeling down as Jamie Shanahan. And it was also included um, Bill Carney and John Flaherty from the stone. And it's... once again, the Abbey didn't get to grips with the ending of this play either. They changed it. 
And Jamie walked off the stage like he did in Robinson's version in 19, um, 1913. And again, he walks off the stage where he's playing the magic glasses. So it's actually never, ever, ever being produced correctly on the professional stage. It's been the amateur community that have ensured it's been um, produced correctly. And the last production of it was by Docus uh, Drama Group in Killarney. And uh, they did a wonderful, wonderful production of it. Fitzmaurice's enthusiasm for this ongoing technological uh, development and how best it might suit his drama is also supported by his reference to television in his infamous note, which he wrote later in life. When I discovered the original note in the Dolman Press archive at Wake Forest University, and there it is on the screen, its whereabouts had been no unknown for many years. But I realized how the scrawled message readily demonstrates Fitzmaurice's clarity of vision and lifelong interest in modern technological advances. It reads, author is prepared to sell outright all rights to 14 plays dealing intimately with life in the Irish countryside. Most have been either produced or published, suitable to which to build musical, television, etc. Pass to anyone interested. Despite the note's general use to epitomize the author's pathetic and lonely demise, it was found after his death. It demonstrates his interest in future adaptations of his plays for television, which was one of the most recent technological inventions to have captured people's imaginations and certainly captured George in the 60s. In the, 1970, in the 1967 production of Magic Glasses, it was performed as part of a double bill alongside The King of the Barnumen, which is a full length play, um, just madcap play. And when it played in 67 on the Abbey stage, it was absolutely loved by critics. But how to describe the play <laughs> short, in a very, very short space of time is difficult. It's set in Karawira and its action revolves around a wrestling tournament and Dermot Rue Malarkey's attempts to win the title of the King of the Barnumen. He has been the undisputed champion for seven years, but believes this is because he was aided by the Hag of Fildarig's magic ointment blue. He wants a chance to win the hand of one of the princesses. And the play is an incredible satire of many things, and the characters are outrageous and very Beckettian, according to some. We keep in mind that it may be Fitzmaurice who influenced Beckett and not the other way around. Described by Seamus Kelly in 1967 as so unmistakably modern that one has to keep reminding oneself that it was written approximately half a century ago. It was in fact written earlier as a superb piece of physicality and it starred Eamon Keane as Aeneas Canty, one of uh, Fitzmaurice's most incredible characterizations. The play had its Kerry premiere in 2013 by the Sleeve Luca Drama Group to commemorate the 50th anniversary of Fitzmaurice's death. And I know Jimmy's, Jimmy's in the audience tonight, he'll remember that as just um, a piece from the Kerry Man and some of our special guests and just the front of the, the commemorative program as well there on the screen. The Dandy Dolls is probably one of Fitzmaurice's best known plays. A drama which appears to be set somewhere between the twilight worlds of the human and the supernatural. Its general plot line revolves around the tale of dollmaker Roger Carmody, whose life is dominated by two obsessions. One is making the perfect dandy doll, and the other is eating geese bones and all. There is demand for these dolls. Firstly, the ghostly grey man who comes to visit and the hag's son, who also comes to rob each new dawn's squeaky squeak, or windpipe, which forces uh, Roger into a feeding frenzy of priest's geese any time this happens. It's an absolute riot of colour and balletic in sequence, despite its unfavourable treatment of the priest character, a mock baptism of the doll, and an adverse image of the Irish peasant's neglect of family. In 1912, when Fitzmaurice submitted the play, it was rejected by Yeats and staged only once during Fitzmaurice's lifetime by the Lyric Theatre Company in 1945. 
The Abbey Theatre finally produced it in 1969, six years after the playwright's death. It is not difficult to imagine Yeats's reasons for not liking the play. It's rather poor language and action. Its second certainly didn't help, and he knew audiences would hate the idea of its mockery of the clergy enough and a sacrilegious act of baptizing an inanimate toy doll. But when the dandy dolls is analyzed in terms of the development of its more fantastic imagery and characters, as well as its highly physicalized action, Fitzmaurice was once more poking fun at the Abbey. He deliberately places a doll as being central to the place action, nailed to the table, like her own stage. And when the character of the hag's son rips out her windpipe, quite literally, it's the physical action and not words that become important to the play. I'm just going to play you a very, very short um, piece again from that radio documentary. And this is when the grey man, who's here, this image here at the top, is a um, photograph of the Grey Man in 1969, the 1969 Abbey production. And down here, it's the 2004 production of the Magic, for, of the Dandy Dolls, which I'll be speaking about in a minute. Hey, surely you're in trouble. Hello, Mary Man, so gay. <laughs> nervous for himself out in the linny the chronic and he up to his ears this minute and making a brand new dandy doll for tis worse than a surly master he at the time he does the manufacturing and if a warrant rubbed a hair to him he'd make a ferocious grin at you that wouldn't shame the old boy himself that's below in the pit of hell roger roger <gasps> here he comes hopping and lord the countenance the devil with the temper flying out of his two eyes in the name of god is it in the other world i was with yourself and your dinner cards the devil's cured you for a bog lack what a burst of music comes from you on the heel of the day and people raising their heads and gaping at you from far and near the lord be thanked my doll was finished for there's a rasp in your cracked old windpipe that would frighten a horse from its oats and many a time that same old screamer was the means of my making a fall dear doll oh now it's me as done the harm is it but the time your old grandmother was the obstacle, not alluding to the day you aimed a prey to at her and hit her on that woeful polypus she had upon her nose. And what about Peg and the time you used to pull her by the hair of her head all around the kitchen floor? Your sister Peg, I'm alluding to, crippled Peg with a crooked eye. Lies and damn lies. Neither lies nor damn lies. And when it becomes you to be thrown the blame on more, you craven thing, hiding under the bed for yourself the time the hag's son would be coming onward in his prowl, leaving the tussle to Timmy and Farley, that little friend of yours that's always to the fore. More lies, for it's well yourself knows I used to fight and struggle till I could fight no more. Timmy, Maria, Timmy is willing surely, but Timmy is devilish weak. Oh, glory, after all he's done for you, the graceful nice garçon. What harm if it's ever a bullseye who brought him from a pattern or a fair? But you're dirty, mean, and craven, and thankless now to both. Peg away, you thief! But you'll fail this turn, whatever, to put me in a wax. For the joy of the world is in me over my new dandy doll. As sound as black oak it is, thanks be to God. Look at it, so charming, and it's beep so gay. It's the finest doll I ever made, caught of the ugly snout. The 1969 Abbey premiere was directed by Hugh Hunt, who understood the need for a more playful direction of the play. Hence, the public-like figures, as you can see in the photographs, just there at the top, uh, the centre, and the right-hand side there. Um, that's the way he decides to play it, just very, very animated and like puppets. However, in 2004, the Abbey revived the play during the Abbey 100 centenary celebrations. The director, Conal Morrison's tribute to Fitzmaurice was immense, and he directed the Dandy Dolls in his own innovative style, and he revealed the play's whole new layer of performativity and physicality, darkness and complexity. And his decision to cast Judith Roddy as the Don introduced a lingering, potent, but contemporary undertone to the play. And the photograph there, that's the grey man that was played by the late Barry Casson. And there you can see the doll on the table. And that's the hag son waiting to rip out her windpipe. And there in the front cover of, um, of 
my biography. That's the very, very last scene from the Dandy Dolls as they're watching um, Roger Carberry being whipped away over the Baronet Hills. And I couldn't resist putting in that photograph. It's um, the get together after the opening night of the Dandy Dolls in 2004, and an absolutely wonderful night with the whole cast there. So we're looking at the Dandy Dolls in the, the Dandy Doll herself in the 2004 production. At one instance, and I'll never forget this image, she was hoisted up and dragged about by the hag's son and the foolish neighbour that was referred to in that uh, audio clip, Timming Feli, in a carefully choreographed tussle involving a strange tabletop three-hand reel. It was a play within a play. Morrison demonstrated exactly what a production of a Fitzmaurice play ought to entail on forced delivery of actors, ensuring the portrayal of its rich lyricism, sharp, imaginative interpretation, careful choreography, and comedy with just an intimation of slapstick humor. Connell Morrison proved there are unlimited possibilities for exciting contemporary productions of Fitzmaurice's work and has repeatedly stressed to me his extreme interest in directing more of the Kerry man's work in the future. In terms of technology, Morrison insisted on the character's very authenticity as his, specific, as his specific directorial agenda revealed the play's whole new layer of performativity and the drama's playful physicality. Because of the way in which Ms. Morrison's production revealed the power of Ms. Morris's imagined world, he had stills behind the stage scene and they depicted a bizarre hybrid of postcard visuals of Ireland. You almost kind of, it was, it's quite touristy, quite like, um, almost like an ad for Falta or Falta Ireland ad for Ireland, mixed with a fantastical other world, which aptly incorporated into the performance and projected onto a large screen above the platform. Reviewing the Dandy Dolls in terms of the Abbey Centenary in 2004, and there had been a lot of complaints about it, Fintan O'Toole insisted that the National Theatre had to revive an old play like George Fitzmaurice's in order to rescue the centenary celebrations from an overall blandness. As if breathing a sigh of relief, he described Fitzmaurice's play as demonstrating how the 21st century avant-garde is a lot more timid than that of the early 20th, and that it was the best thing to be staged all year. If one believed in the spirits of previously disgruntled, disgruntled playwrights like George himself, haunting the hallowed ground of the National Theatre foyer, such a review might have seemed poetic justice indeed. These Abbey productions in 1967 and 1969 were, of course, posthumous, Fitzmaurice having just died in 1963. In 1976, two further revivals, a double bill again, were staged by the Abbey. The first I've already spoken about, Pydish, um, and the second was a play not terribly well known, a full-length play, The Enchanted Land, which is set dramatically in two different worlds. An underwater chamber tells the story, it's set in an underwater chamber for the first half, and it tells the story of Esna, a commoner, who was exiled to the underwater world because she was in love with the King of Ireland's son. As she has completed her stay, she is to go back to Ireland. However, Elaine, the 12th Toad Mermaid, wants to be Queen of Ireland. Elaine, the, Elaine attempts to replace Esna on Earth and become Queen of Ireland. It's quite a mad play. With no history of physical theatre in Ireland during the early years of the 20th century, Fitzmaurice was aware of the frustration of Irish theatres overriding literary tradition. And when Christopher Ball was, um, was designing the set and the costumes for the 76 production of the uh, Enchanted Land, he certainly had that in mind. And you can just see they're not terribly good images there on the slide, but these are just some of his initial drafts and sketches for various characters and costuming. And the bottom left-hand corner, that is the um, second um, part of the play set in the overworld, set in Ireland itself. And again, it's, it's almost like Alice in Wonderland type, um, type set. 
Dialogue was the primary means of communication in early Irish 20th century um, theatre, and in particular by the Abbey. And a conventionally established language of physical theatre was not available at this time, when the Kerry writer was at his most active. This, of course, was to his detriment. No more of Fitzmaurice's plays have been included in the Abbey Theatre repertoire since 2004, save for a rehearsed reading of the Dandy Dolls in September 2009, which was part of a weekend programme to celebrate the playwright Ryan Freel's 80th birthday. And I, I'm sorry, I couldn't resist putting this slide in. Having been asked by the Abbey Theatre to choose some of his favourite plays, which would feature as a series of rehearsed readings, Feel Freel decided upon two Fitzmaurice plays, The Dandy Dolls and The Magic Glasses. In the end, he was limited and could choose only one of the Fitzmaurice's plays, and he chose The Dandy Dolls. And it was an incredible rehearsed reading. Um, and I was sitting beside uh, my friend and former supervisor, Jeff Fitzgibbon, and then Freel was beside him, and we were, just, we were just in cloud nine, the two of us. So I got a chance to talk to Brian, after after the, the rehearsed reading and we were there in the Peacock Theatre. Luckily, I had the photograph taken with him and I said, I'm going to ask him now what he really thinks the Dandy Dolls is all about. It's, it's going to be profound. And um, he just looked at me and in a roguish manner, he made a two word reply. He said the Dandy Dolls was about kinky sex. And I think he expected me to be absolutely mortified by the thought. But instead, I just couldn't stop laughing. We just had such, such a laugh. And there was just such a glint in his eye. So I asked him, could I quote him? And I did. I later quoted him in my thesis, so I was delighted. So given Freel's interest in Fitzmaurice, it's only natural that one would begin to wonder about the Kerry man's possible influence on Freel's own playwriting. Freel wrote a play called The Communication Chord in 1982. And it's a deliberate farce of comedy and hilarious intrigue set in a traditional Irish cottage. It concludes with a reference to the complete collapse of a loft and a roof. As the character Tim is warned to get away from the upright, you'll bring the roof down. The floor begins to shake and suddenly the big door blows open. The lamp flickers almost dies. The sound of cracking timbers increase. We then hear Nora, another character saying, the house is falling in. I can only ever hear the echoes of Fitzmaurice's The Magic Glasses. The house is falling down. When Freel explained to Aideen Howard, then Abbey Literary Director, why he chose Fitzmaurice's plays, he wrote, I'm profoundly uncertain about Fitzmaurice, but swept away by his language, which is a kind of delirium, a frenzied excitement that is so off the wall that it scarcely performs the function of language. I certainly don't trust it, but I'm in awe of his prodigality. As for his characters, they're what they say, and what they say doesn't really endow them with coherence or intellig intellig intelligibility. All the same, just listening to them is intoxicating. I've often heard it said that we need to redress Fitzmaurice, how Fitzmaurice's plays might be staged in new and creative ways. And at the minute, they're out of print. And the top left-hand corner are the four Dalman Press editions of Fitz, all of Fitzmaurice's literary canon. You have the three volumes of his plays, and you also have a volume of the, his short stories, The Cause of Mephistopheles. And on the right-hand corner, I just wanted to put in a photograph of Lee Miller because without Lee Miller's contribution and his belief in George Fitzmaurice, these plays would quite possibly be completely lost. And in the bottom left-hand corner, we have uh, just the, the inside page of Fitzmaurice's uh, volume of five plays, which was published in 1914. Um, and there were a number of his other plays published in various period periodicals during his lifetime. So when it comes to talking about redressing how Fitzmaurice is remembered and how we might stage his plays in new and creative ways, I always come back to Drood Singh and how daring they were and brave in staging all of Singh's, John Millington Singh's six plays in 2005. And they had an overwhelming advantage in that Singh's work is more widely known. 
but it's not to say that the same thing couldn't be done with Fitzmaurice. Fintan O'Toole served to remind us that Singh was not just a much neglected writer before Drood took him on, but that Drood could not possibly have undertaken this ambitious project if the company hadn't already produced Singh in 1974. They also included Singh in its repertoire in the 1970s and the 1980s, and they included two Fitzmaurice's plays in their repertoire in the 1990s. So it serves as a timely reminder of the possibility for a more innovative presentation of Fitzmaurice's work than has ever been imagined. By staging a number of his one-act plays as a single production, for example, The Pilish, Magic Glasses and The Dandy Dogs, in a one-night production, or stage them individually during lunchtime seasons, this would serve to introduce Fitzmaurice to a new generation of spectators and would enable a greater understanding of his themes and his imagery, as well as the reimagining of his original dialogue with the Abbey dramatic, with the Irish dramatic movement and with us. The very obscurity of these plays has often been pinpointed as a reason why Fitzmaurice's drama is not suitable for today's audiences. But it is actually this very obscurity that should be used to our advantage in seeking to adapt them for the 21st century stage. The Irish playwright George Fitzmaurice, born in 1877, died in 1963, has bequeathed Irish theatre a whirlwind dramatic legacy that displays unforgettable writing, angst, colourful and extravagant, extravagantly compl com complicated visual, phonetic, poetic, cultural and political violence and outrage. His deliberately physicalised theatre so wholly dependent on the sense of the unreal and the experimental should be on stage. His neighbours and his friends in North Kerry knew what was in Fitzmaurice's heart. His cousin Marjorie Fitzmaurice, whom I met 20 years ago to interview, repeated a number of times that day, we ought to have been proud of him. One of the most special occasions ever during my lengthy research of Fitzmaurice, and there have been many, was my first ever meeting with Eamon Kelly, who was a huge admirer of Fitzmaurice and whose voice we heard tonight as Quill in the Magic Glasses. I just want to finish by reading the last paragraph from my biography on Fitzmaurice. And it's just a description of um, the night that I, made, I, met, um, I met Eamon, a very, very windy, windy, wet evening in January in Dublin. On a wet January evening in 2000, I met with Eamon Kelly at the Abbey Theatre. As we sat upstairs chatting, I was enthralled just listening to Eamon speaking about his role as Lame Dunhu in the Pidish. It was almost as if he had travelled backwards in time, visualising himself on stage during a performance. Eamon went quiet for a while and looked out into the night. After a short period of time spent in reflection, he turned slowly to face me. Looking to me directly with soft, sincere eyes, he said very, very gently, you know, he was wild in his own way. And you know what? I think George would just as quietly agree. Thank you so much for listening.